Welcome back to the Tecmo HD podcast. Today I'm speaking with Ben from Ontario, Canada. Ben's been a mechanic for over a decade, working on everything from buses and trucks to cranes. Let's hear his story. So tell me about yourself. When you got started, bring me back way to like, what inspired you to be a mechanic? Uh, if I'm being 100% honest, I don't remember a time where I wanted to do anything else. Not necessarily wanted to get into heavy truck. Uh, I always wanted automotive, to be honest with you. But uh, no matter how hard I try, things never lined up. It uh, was either, you know, we're not hiring or you don't have the right experience. Or, yeah, it just kind of felt something that fell into my lap. My first actual mechanics job was at a golf course working on uh, the mowers and things like that. And uh, when it came time to go to school for an apprenticeship, there wasn't enough interest in the program. Like, I think I was the only one between the, the Niagara, Hamilton, and Toronto region that was registered for the program. So they canceled it. Oh, wow, really? I was forced to sit back and look, and it was like, okay, well, I don't think this trade's going to work out. What else is out there? And uh, there was a, a local shop where I live was looking for a, a 310T apprentice. So I thought, okay, well, let's give it a try. That was it was 2011, and, uh, yeah, I've been in, been in the trade since 2011, and I've been a licensed 310T since 2015. Cool. Walk me through your first job. So you got hired at that place. What kind of stuff did you do there? That job was a lot of the old coach buses. So they did a lot of work for the hotels, uh, offered like wine tours to the customers. They had uh, older MCI coach buses. They had some Freightliner buses and a lot of smaller shuttle buses, like the short school bus platform, I guess it would yeah. be an easy way to put it. Yeah. So I worked on a lot of those. They, they had some customers with some like stray trucks and things like that. I did that job for the entirety of my apprenticeship and I got my license through them. We had our set customers or our set jobs that we would always do for certain people, but anything and everything that came through the door, really. Cool. Um, yeah. How long did you work there for? I was there from 2011 until, like I said, 2011 until 2015. So I got my license, what was it? May of 2015, I think. I ended up leaving that job for specifically an ambulance shop about an hour away. The short shuttle bus platforms that I talked about, out of a five-day week, it got to a point where three out of five days, that system, so the specifically Ford six-liter diesel platform, is uh, is all I was working on. And uh, this ambulance company, that's all they had, really. was uh, They had about 150 trucks Ontario-wide, and about 120. 20 of them or so were based out of Hamilton, so about an hour away from where I live. For the time, it was a good move for me. They were able to pay a little bit more. Commuting was not great, but I made it work. Yeah. So that was about 2015. How long do you work there for, the ambulance? I worked there from 2015 up until 2020. They just made some poor business decisions. We were told the, the December prior they were going to be shutting down. They were closing their doors. You mean the shop that fixed the ambulances, right? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow, that's crazy. That would yeah, seem it, like a pretty solid gig, right? Because it was ambulance, it was medical transport, so I thought the same thing. I thought, you know, hey, this is medical. There are always, there's always patients. So I, I thought it was, I thought the same thing. That Obviously. seems something logical the government would do is like, let's just not maintain the ambulances. Who needs them? Yeah, it, it kind of came as a shock all around. Yeah. So it is what it is. 2020 happened, probably a time for everyone that we'd love to forget. What did you do from there? You were probably shocked, right? Oh, very much so. So what? I couldn't have come, couldn't have come at a worse time. I just had my first child by then. Wow. So what was the plan Uh, then? What did you think? I turned around and uh, just, I, like I said, we got told in December. So I had some time to think and uh, I ended up at a uh, Freightliner dealership. Okay. I needed a job. They hired me on it. So I was a Freightliner tech for about three years. After wow. That. Okay. And how was working at the dealer different than what you were doing before? Like what are the pros and cons of that? The pros obviously would have been like the access to information and software and things like that. Like all the diagnostic software, all the genuine, the OEM like tooling, like, you know, steel drivers and injector pullers and all that stuff. Coming from a fleet atmosphere... It was a bit of a culture shock. Physically, it was the biggest shop I'd worked in. The amount of bays and the amount of work that rolled through it. The shop that I came from was just a two-bay, two-guy shop. It was just me and another guy. The cons were, I guess you could say, some of the older guys that had been uh, in the trade. You know, they were the older seasoned guys. 
some of the attitudes where we just didn't get along in the beginning, I would say. I just kind of tried to keep to myself and do my own thing, just do the work. There were a couple, let's say, personality clashes, let's just say. That was really the only con, I would say, was having to learn to work around other people when they're having a bad day kind of thing. Is that just they're jaded in their job or they just, is it a per, just personality clash or are they probably that way with everyone? Probably it was more so the fact that they were just jaded and they were the guys that had been doing it for 30 years at the time. So maybe they were having a bad day or maybe maybe something was hurting that was making them kind of grumpy or whatever the case. Did you learn a lot there? Yeah. Looking back at it, I learned a lot. If I could go back, I'd probably make the change to a dealership sooner just because I feel like I missed the opportunity to learn even more in a younger age, especially regarding things like after treatment and emissions and things like that. Yeah, because I guess a lot of the stuff you started working on didn't have that stuff, right? It was kind of the older, probably older stuff? It was, what did have it, it was like just the beginning stages of it. Okay, and so if you're gonna advise someone coming out of trade school, they can go and work for independent or work at the dealer, what would your advice be to them? I would say it depends on what you're looking for. If you have a desire to learn, like I went into the dealership wanting to be the best of the best and, you know, have every certification possible and learn every possible aspect of it or what, you know, hey, do you want to do this training? My answer was always yes. Do you want to do training for this? Absolutely. The learning potential, I would say, is huge. If you want to learn the newest, like the newest systems and the most up-to-date systems, yeah, I would say absolutely a dealership atmosphere would be a better choice for you. If you're just somebody that's coming out of trade school and you just want to get your hands dirty yeah an independent shop would definitely be a good way to go i guess it depends too on what's available to you like who's in your your area yeah if yeah. you're in a larger area like say toronto you might have access to more dealers than if you're outside of toronto like in a small small town kind of thing and in all the people you've worked with in the past I i'm sure you've worked with the people who we're better off just working at a you know regular job, not too ambitious to learn new things, just doing their thing, right? And then you've probably learned or you've met people that are super ambitious, want to learn everything, be the best they can, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I went into the dealership wanting to be the best of the best and wanting to build that reputation of, oh, you know, there's this truck that, you know, it's been to five other shops that nobody can figure out. Yeah. Send it to go send it to Ben at this dealership. And, you know, I, that's what I wanted. That's cool. Uh, yeah, that's really prior, cool. Yeah, that was my goal, at least. And, you know, looking back at it, really had a good time working at, dealer, at the dealership. Was it all sunshine and rainbows? No. You know, there there were some days where I considered locking the toolbox up and shoving it into traffic and going to do something else kind of thing. Do you remember something that caused you to feel that way? Like that moment where you're like, I've had enough, I'm done. Is it something they yeah. did? Is it is it something they always did? It was kind of the work that they took on sort of thing. The dealership that I worked at was bought, let's just say, like it was a, it was originally a mom and pop shop. And then a large dealership came through and said, we want to buy you so you can fly our flag and say, you're this dealer that, you know, offers this service. But they still took on a lot of the work, which isn't a bad thing, but they took on a lot of the work as if they were still a mom and pop shop. So there were some jobs, like I can think of one job in particular in my head, it's uh it was an old logging truck that a, a good customer of theirs bought and they wanted to turn it into a show truck. He came in to be looked over for its for a safety so they could get plates for it. And the further we got into the repairs, the worse things got to the point where I, did, I remember I had to change a cross member under the cab and from the back of the cab to the back of the frame of the truck, I literally had to take every single nut, bolt, and washer off to do this job. And it was just like... I think by the time I was done, I had like 120 hours into the truck. Wow. And it was just, it was just miserable. Wow. Yeah. That was, that's definitely one that sticks out in my mind. Yeah. And so when the new company took over, what was the main thing they did in changing their business practices? What was the most noticeable thing that happened? That's a hard one to answer because I came in after the fact, like they had already, okay. they had already been bought and were already a, a dealership after. I think it was. By that point, it had been four or five years, I think. Okay, yeah. I learned about the history after getting my foot in the door, and when I was there, it was always a dealership. Got it. What about the dealer model? Is there something that they always did, the way they ran their business? Anything that you look at and were like, man, I wouldn't be doing that. Again, that's a hard one to answer, I think, because I've never 
wanted to own my own shop, let's just say. I've always just been a, a tech on the floor fixing trucks, right? Not as involved in the business element of it. You put your head down, get your work done, and service yeah, managers and whatever take care of the rest, right? For the most part, yeah. Like, I've always just been, we'll say I've done it, but I've kind of filled the role for a day of the shop foreman or the lead hand is, you know, he's on vacation or whatever. So, well, especially on, on night shift, for example, we ran a skeleton crew. So if you were the head tech for the night, you were the foreman for the week kind of thing until you rotate out during back on days kind of thing. So, yeah, but that's a tough one to answer. I really can't think of one thing specifically that I would have said, I said, Hey, if I own this, if I was the owner, I would do it this way or that way. I never really sat back and thought about that. When did you realize it was time to leave? Family priorities changed. We had another child. Having a newborn while trying to work a rotating afternoon shift made things difficult, especially with issues at night, you know, night feeds and things like that. Plus, my wife, her maternity leave was up and she didn't want to go back to work. Like, she wanted to stay home with the kids. I wanted her to stay home with the kids. And unfortunately, the dealership just couldn't pay enough they tried yeah they just couldn't pay to the point where i needed to be financially yeah and i mean it was a case of the more training you get and the more certifications you get the more you'll make and which is true and i i realize that but when you've got you know her maternity leave is up in you know nine months and the training that you're talking about is going to take me three years it was an unfortunate and it was a very hard decision for me to make to leave the dealership i really didn't want to do it but my family priorities kind of took over and said, okay, I, I need to do something now. So. And so what did you do then? I'm uh, working for a, a large crane company now. But, okay. Uh, I'm still just a truck mechanic, but they got up to from trucks, trailers, all the way up to 500 ton crane. Cool. So you made a, a leap to another employer that was more flexible in, in what you wanted out of work, right? Yeah, I guess that's a good way to say it. Like, they were more open to, to overtime. Like, the, the dealership sort of frowned on overtime. Like, if only if it was absolutely necessary. Like, parts came in at a late time, and the customer is absolutely, you know, they can't wait for the truck till tomorrow. It's got to go in the next two hours kind of thing. That's one thing. The earlier starts as well. Out, like, our scheduled hours were pretty rigid at the dealership. The company that I work for now, like, I have what I'll call contract hours. Okay. But if I want to come, if I want to come in, say two hours early and stay an extra half hour for whatever reason, then they're like, yeah, it's just put in your hours and record whatever you work. If you want to work more, great. If you want to work less, just tell us the kind of thing. Cool. And so that's a mobile job now, right? We sort of do a bit of both in shop and mobile. We have certain sites that we service. And there's obviously breakdowns as well. So I, I do spend some time in the service truck. It's not consistent. It depends on the day. Just last week, I had to go about two hours north for a crane. And that's the extent of it, I would say. Cool. Do you prefer shop work or mobile stuff? Honestly, it depends on the day. Like, you know, obviously, if it's summertime and it's nice weather and things like that, it is nice to get out of the shop. I won't lie. I won't say it's my favorite thing to do. Like, I've been on, you know, when you're laying on the side of the highway in a snowstorm trying to get the brakes on the release on a trailer that locked up that's when things get crappy and so now working on cranes what's the biggest difference because you spent most of your career working on highway stuff right like buses and yeah. trucks and then now you're dealing with cranes is there a difference to you in, in the work obviously it's different machinery the hydraulics being a big thing i apart from you know changing the obvious blown hydraulic hose i didn't have much hydraulic experience coming up to this Still really only just got my feet wet with it. That would be the big thing, the hydraulics. And then I would say the upper system electrical. So like some of the larger cranes have, they've got like a lower engine to drive the crane, like physically drive it down the road. But okay. then when they're doing a lift, some of the larger cranes have an upper engine as well. So there's two separate electrical systems on them as well. Oh, wow. That sounds complicated. Oh, definitely. There are some similarities that have sort of folded over like uh the gate air conditioning system, for example, the general concept is mostly the same. Just the, uh, I'll say the component locations, obviously, is where you got to figure things out. But yeah, those would probably be the two biggest things that stick in my mind. And then, of course, the sheer size of them. Well, when you get up into a 500-ton crane, they're, they're pretty big pieces of equipment. Are you always buying new tools? Not really, to be honest with you. Apart from certain wants, like I want this test light or I want this voltmeter or whatever the case, I pretty much have just been able to slide right into it. There hasn't really been 
much of anything that I've absolutely needed to buy to get any kind of a job done. So what's your most important tool, your favorite tool or, or your top three? Top three? My voltmeter would be one. My pinout kit would be another. I've got a specific Daimler or Detroit pinout kit, but I've noticed that it fits a lot of the wire terminals on these cranes as well, like just the, the size of them. So I would say those two. And then three, probably my three eighth electric impact. Okay. Like you, the cordless factor, you just grab it and you grab it, whatever sockets you need and you're off to the races. What are your plans? What's your th- three year plan? Are you going to keep doing that? Do you want to go on your own? What are you thinking? You know, if you'd asked me that five years ago, I'd say there's no way I'd be going out on my own, but I'd be lying now. I think the itch is there, whether or not I go into a service truck itself or I, I get my own building in my own shop. Do you see opportunities in your region for going on? What would be your main objective for going on your own? Because I assume that when you go on your own, even if you're doing the same amount of work, there's so many other things to take care of, right? Like oh, 100%. business admin and running the business. and Absolutely. I would say depending on what you want to do, like if you want to be strictly truck mechanic, like a, a mobile truck mechanic, I would say, yeah, you'd probably be in good shape. I really couldn't comment about about being a heavy equipment guy because I just don't have the exposure to it. Like, you know, like guys like Cam or Tyler or anything like someone like that. At least they, those are the guys that come to my mind just because I haven't actually seen or been exposed to the equipment side, like invaders, bulldozers and things like that. But I'm sure. So if you were not limited by anything and let's just say you made the decision of going on your own, what type of equipment would you work on? You already said you'd you'd have a shop, ideally. I think it would be difficult, personally, think it would be difficult to have a shop without a service truck. I would think you need the service truck and then maybe the shop is secondary. What do you think about that? I definitely agree with you. I've seen shops that don't get into doing road calls for whatever reason, whether they don't have the manpower or they're just not interested in doing it. The bus shop that I worked at, they didn't have a service truck. They weren't interested in doing road calls. They didn't have the insurance and the proper things in place to do road calls. Anything that we really did was just, you know, go load up a couple of tools in in an old pickup truck and go change this brake chamber at a customer's yard. That was the extent of any road calls that I did there. Like it really wasn't too intense. I didn't start doing road calls until I was at the dealership, really. Actually, that does make sense. I think you're right. I think if you strictly say, look, if you can't get it here, I can't work on it. And just, yeah. you know, focus, stay in your lane. That actually makes sense too. We obviously started as a mobile equipment repair company. And so that's okay. my mind is set there. Yeah. But I agree. I think you could just be like, no, we're not going to, I got a pickup truck, a mobile toolbox I can throw in. That's the extent to, of my mobile stuff. And just stay in your lane, build your shop and get a, a steady lineup of customers. Yeah, that's what been my experience with it i was never against the idea of it it was that shop that i worked at the bus shop they were getting older like the the owners of the company were getting older and they'd already put in their 20 years by the time that i had gotten there so they were just taking it one day at a time kind of thing yeah that's just what they wanted to do and like i said there was the odd time we'd load up a few small things in the pickup and go rescue somebody but it was never intense on the side of the highway kind of thing i didn't start doing that until i was at the dealership it was kind of luck of the draw who was going to be put in the service truck for that call like say you finish the job just you know just as you're pulling your last job out the door the call came in for you know so and so broke down fully loaded their truck won't start or do whatever it was but if you were into something big say you're doing an engine job for somebody in the shop they would give the service call to somebody else who was waiting for their next job kind of thing yeah yeah. And I, so if you paint your ideal situation in, you know, okay. your next year out, what do you envision it to be? You're not limited by anything. A perfect setup would be for you in the next couple of years. Perfect setup in the next couple of years. I guess it would be having a shop of my own, but strictly doing, I would say, after treatment diagnostic work or just doing engines, like being like a, an engine builder or Rebuilds? engine repair. Okay. Yeah. Rebuilds, okay. remands, that sort of thing. Not, you know, hey, we've got this truck that just needs a service. If it's a real, real good customer, then maybe we'd help them out, but not looking to get into the the general service work, I would say. The diagnostics is what really interests me and what really keeps me going, like what makes them tick, that sort of thing. Yeah. The electronics, that's where my interests are. 
in the trade. So I have been exposed to like the Detroit, the Cummins and things like that. I would love to get my hands into Caterpillar equipment systems or case or anything like that. It's just how my time in the trade is gone. That makes sense. Diagnostics, after treatment, engine rebuilds, c- component rebuilds, or just mainly engine? Oh, I'd give the components a try. And you'd be confident that you'd be good enough at doing that, and you're not biting off more than you could chew by focusing on that. I think that's a good niche for you. Okay. It's something I'd be willing to give a world. I can't say I've done it, but definitely not scared to try. And then who would be your biggest competitor? If you were just doing after treatment and engine rebuilds 80 percent of your business is that who do you think your biggest competitor would be the dealers or do you know other companies who've done that i don't personally but i've never really looked for it so okay i would say i would say probably the dealership itself do you know anyone that you've worked with before that went out on their own no actually i can't think of that so it's not a common thing in your area then oh i'm sure there are people who have yeah i i just personally don't know anybody who has so what do you think your biggest struggle or challenge will be to get you set up in the shop financially for sure but also the fear of if things go sideways and it doesn't work out there's a lot to lose yeah that might be that's definitely the biggest i think the number one thing that holds everyone back is the fear of you know you have a family right you you need to yeah. you need to pay the bills exactly what challenges do you think the heavy equipment industry is facing do you think there's enough people who are interested in this I say heavy equipment industry that you're in as well. Do you think there's enough young people getting into it? No, I don't think so. People don't want to do this, whether it's people don't want to get down and dirty and do the work or they listen to the older guys, like the guys who've been in the trade for 40 years. They listen to them going, no, don't do this. You'll make more money doing something else. No, I I don't think there's enough people getting back into it. So the manpower demand is going to be huge. Yeah, I think so. What would you do to inspire the next generation? Do people ever talk to you? Do you you ever say, hey, you should, you know, because it's not for everyone. That's obviously our goal with Tecmo. And what we're doing is trying to inspire the next generation. But have you talked to young people? Have you ever inspired someone to to get into it? I've talked to a couple people. Absolutely. I can't say I've even had an, like, I've trained an apprentice. I've worked alongside a couple apprentices, but they usually ended up deciding they didn't want to do this for other reasons. I'd love to have an apprentice or I'd love to have somebody to train and work alongside me as far as what I would do just kind of if I could be honest treat him how I wanted to be treated while when I was an apprentice did you have a mentor as well when you were getting started oh yeah yeah I did and uh absolutely wonderful wonderful guy there were I won't I won't call him a bad guy by any means we had a few bumps in the road for sure but ultimately you know I learned a lot I still put things into play like the way he trained me to do you know 13 years later kind of thing yeah yeah that's awesome. Thanks for your time. What do you think Tecmo could do to help you with your aspirations and the things that you are looking to do for yourself? That's kind of a tough one to answer. The whole point of me filling out the, the online form is I just wanted to learn more about Tecmo itself and who you guys are and what you guys do. And like I knew I, all I really know about is just what I've seen on YouTube and things like that. Basically, what we're doing, less so on highway stuff, we actually almost consciously avoid the on highway stuff just from a liability perspective. It's incredibly important for our economy to make sure trucks are working. For us, heavy equipment was a focus. Doesn't mean that won't change. What we're trying to do is connect, like the big picture is connecting a network of independent mechanics with people who need mechanics. And a big focus for us is eventually going to be on OEMs that don't have a service presence in a certain region. And so they're going to rely, you know, maybe they have unique equipment like a rock crusher, for example. For them, it's hard to sell, even though their equipment might be better, it's hard to sell in certain areas because they don't have the service support, maintenance support. So what we're trying to do is work with specific OEMs and connect them with our network of mechanics all over North America. If I could recommend something... If there was a chance of you working with Tecamo in your endeavors and starting your own business or whatever, and I know this is like off what you said, doesn't really align. Crane maintenance and repair is a very good thing to get into because if you get to learn about cranes, all of your experience that you've learned from other stuff, it's applicable, right? Because everything has an engine. Oh, sure. And so engines are just one aspect. But if you learn about the hydraulics, the sensors, the electrical, I think there's a huge demand for crane techs, for sure. 
Oh, for sure. And that's a I different don't... world. But I'd learn everything you can about that. And then that could open the door. Because the thing is supply and demand, right? How many we absolutely already talked about how many mechanics are getting into it. So just by be, you being a mechanic on anything, it sets you apart from 99.9% .9 of the rest of the world because no one wants to get into it. But That's if you nice. niche out in cranes or certain things with heavy equipment, I personally think, and this like I, I'm biased, obviously, <laughs> we film heavy <laughs> equipment, right? I think that if you could get experience there and work on that stuff, you won't go wrong. You're probably right. To everyone listening, we'd love to hear your feedback. If you have any follow-up questions, let us know. If you're tuning in on YouTube, you can subscribe and leave a comment. If you'd like to be a guest on the podcast, reach out by email at media at techmohd.com. If you have any follow-up questions, let us know. Remember that when you need to buy tools, parts, undercarriage, engines, final drives, rubber tracks, call Fortis because every sale helps Tecmo to produce great content and also helps to bring awareness to the industry. Thanks again, guys.